one man thought he knew. The problem of biological origins has, for a very long time, I would say, has been a real deep interest to me just because of the scale of the problem, the importance of it. Uh, where did we come from? Uh, what are, why are we here? Uh, all that kind of uh, question. Uh, probed from the point of view of natural science. During the late 1960s and throughout the 70s and early 80s, Dean Kenyon was one of the leading chemical evolutionary theorists in the world. And like others in his field, he was trying to explain how life on Earth began through a purely natural process. In 1969, Kenyon co-authored an important book on the origin of life. Gary Steinman and myself thought that uh, if we were to pull together um, in uh, all of the uh, lines of empirical uh, evidence that had accumulated by the uh, mid to late uh, 60s in one continuous uh, argument, we were very enthusiastic about the possibilities uh, for explaining uh, the origin of the main life-building elements. Despite his optimism, Kenyon faced a significant problem. To explain how life began, he first had to account for the origin of the essential building blocks of every cell that has existed on Earth, large complex molecules called proteins. Kenyon knew that proteins would have been as important to the first life as they are to living cells today. He also recognized the complexity of their construction. In his book, Biochemical Predestination, Kenyon and his co-author, Gary Steinman, proposed an intriguing theory. Kenyon wrote, Life might have been biochemically predestined by the properties of attraction that exist between its chemical parts, particularly between amino acids in proteins. At the time that biochemical predestination came out, I and my uh, co-author were totally convinced that we had the scientific explanation for origins. Many scientists embraced Kenyon's ideas, and over the next 20 years, biochemical predestination became a best-selling text on the theory of chemical evolution. Yet five years after the book's publication, Kenyon quietly began to doubt the plausibility of his own theory. It was during that whole period of time that my doubts about certain aspects of the evolutionary account became apparent. When coming into contact with a powerful counter-argument given to me by one of my students, and I could not refute that counter-argument. Kenyon was challenged to explain how the first proteins could have been assembled without the help of genetic instructions. 